Group B had now taken over the hearts and minds of many in the world of motorsports. So far it had propelled many great cars and drivers into the spotlight. While the new rule set did have a slow start, it was quickly picking up pace. As the year turned to 1985, what had previously been a two or three way fight for the podium suddenly turned into a free for all with many manufacturers introducing intricately designed cars. Lancia was the first up to bat. While the O37 had won the 1983 season, the writing was on the wall. Rear wheel drive simply wasn't as successful anymore. Even after introducing the Evo 2 model with uprated power and numerous modifications, it was becoming a bit of a liability. They needed those front wheels under power too. Lancia needed their own four wheel drive racehorse and so they introduced the extreme Lancia Delta S4. Featuring something called twin charging where both a turbocharger and supercharger is fitted, the 1.7 litre inline 4 made 483 horsepower, some saying that could be as high as 500. And there were even sources that quoted the engine making up to a thousand horsepower under extreme conditions. Remember, this is the mid 1980s. The mid mounted four wheel drive S4 shared almost nothing in common with the front engine front wheel drive production delta. Ford finally made a return after many years with the RS200. Initially they had planned to make their next rally car once again a modified Escort like previous rallying endeavours, this time the Mark III known as the Escort RS1700T. However the project was plagued with problems from the start and therefore Ford decided to just simply build a car from the ground up, the only Group B car to be as such and what resulted was the RS200. The mid-mounted 1.8 litre straight 4 BDT engine made either 380 brake horsepower or 444 brake horsepower based on different sources. It featured a completely fiberglass body and a large wing and a roof duct in order to aid downforce. Both the Lancia and Ford were created in 1985 but wouldn't compete until 1986. Other manufacturers began to enter too. MG launched the strange little Metro 6R4 with both a rear and front spoiler fitted with a 3 litre V6 making 450 brake horsepower. It was also unique in the fact that it was actually naturally aspirated unlike many of its competitors at the time. Now that there were so many teams going for the win it was obvious that it would be a close fight for the title. However, Peugeot, who were now racing their 205 T16 E2 model with a larger wing, a new turbocharger and a 550 horsepower engine in the captain's seat, knew of the rising competition and weren't willing to simply sit back and let all these new manufacturers take the crown. The 1985 season, despite showcasing so many incredible contenders, also showcased some of the cracks that were starting to show as a result of the easygoing regulations. At the fourth stage of the Tour de Corsa, driver Atio Bottega tragically struck a tree in his Lancia 37 and was killed instantly. Ari Vatanen, who was leading the Peugeot team towards victory and was set to take the driver's championship too, also suffered a crash, though non-fatal, when his 205 flipped end over front at Rally Argentina. Still, even with one of their star drivers out for the season, the Peugeot team powered through and took their first WRC title after so many years of on and off competing, and Vatanen's teammate Timo Salonen would swoop in for the driver's title. The 1985 season would also mark the final win at the wheels of the legendary Audi Quattro, as the company was quickly losing interest in the programme largely due to the increasing focus on the potential danger of Group B rally, not to mention the tough competition from Persia. 1986 however has gone down in history as one of the most important seasons in the sport. It was largely characterised by the dogfight between Peugeot and Lancia who were now racing their Delta S4 full time after making a victorious first appearance at the final rally of the 1985 season. Despite this, and despite the impressive efforts by the teams competing, the cars were simply becoming too fast, too unpredictable and too unruly, and while the drivers were some of the finest the world had ever seen, even they couldn't always guarantee complete control of their car. The first accident came at the third rally, Portugal. Joaquim Santos lost control of his Ford RS200 while cresting a hill and plunged into a crowd of spectators. 30 were reportedly injured and 3 were killed. 
Another fatal crash happened just a few months later at the Tour de Corsa. Henry Toivonen and his co-driver Sergio Cresto plunged off the edge of the course into the trees and the car quickly exploded into flames as the aluminium fuel tank was ruptured. While the crash would have likely not killed the two immediately, the drivers had no time to escape from the car and likely burnt alive while still strapped in their seats. While there were no nearby witnesses of the crash, when the twisted charred skeleton of the Lancia was lifted back out, it was clear that there was nothing that anyone could have done. There was another problem that was getting out of hand too. The spectators. Group B was immensely popular by the mid 80s and there were hundreds of thousands of spectators lining the course on any given rally. Mix that with a lack of protective barriers and the utter stupidity of certain individuals who thought it a good idea to try and touch the cars as they went past or even to run out in front of them and the deaths were beginning to cast a shadow. These two accidents in combination with those that had happened previously and the mounting fear for both drivers and spectators put Group B into a limbo state. While the 1986 season was raced to its end, resulting in Peugeot and their driver Yuha Kankunen claiming the manufacturer's and driver's titles respectively, it was inevitably decided that Group B would no longer be raced after that year. This came at a poor time for the organisers. The FIA was actually planning to phase out Group B anyway for the 1988 season, replacing it with a more refined championship with a harsher rule set called Group S. The championship had first been proposed by FISA's then president Jean-Marie Balestra in 1984. However, with the Group B championship being cancelled, it was also decided to axe Group S along with it. The prototypes that manufacturers like Audi, Lancia, Mazda and Toyota had all constructed therefore were not going to be able to race. Even with further revisions to the rule set, such as imposing a strict limit of just 300 horsepower on the cars and also moving the homologation up to 1987, one year ahead of original schedule, Balestra believed that Group S wouldn't stop the excessive meddling with the rule set like it had been in Group B. Therefore, Group A was put in place as the new standard in the WRC, being raced with touring cars based on production cars. Therefore, a new era of rally had begun once again, and to many manufacturers it was detrimental. Many were in the process of building both Group B and Group S cars at the time of the axe and simply didn't have cars that were eligible to race in the Group A category. The likes of Peugeot were furious with the change, they had a dominant racer in their lineup and simply didn't have an immediate replacement for Group A. But there was one standout manufacturer this year and its name was Lancia, because unlike so many other manufacturers, Lancia had the perfect car to introduce. In their case, it was the Delta, which had already seen competition as the S4. This time, however, they rebuilt it to have a 2 litre inline 4 making 163 horsepower and was known as the HF 4 wheel drive. Despite being quickly designed and introduced and having numerous flaws, the competition was so lacking it easily steamrolled the entire year, winning 9 out of the 13 rallies of the 1987 season. Manufacturers like Audi with the 200 Quattro and Ford with the underpowered Sierra XR 4x4 simply couldn't keep up. The Delta was quick to modify and race and Lancia took full advantage of this. It was repeated in 1988 with an even more dominant performance with 10 wins in total. Ford was the only other manufacturer to win a rally where points for the manufacturer championship were concerned. Lancia introduced the far more refined HF Integrale partway through the season. And you may have guessed, Lancia returned for a hat trick in 1989, still far ahead of any of the competition. They were now racing the Integrale 16 valve, which symbolised Lancia's constant fight to improve the Delta, despite no real competition. However, the 1989 win wasn't quite the clean sweep they had experienced previously. Toyota proved to show some resistance to the Italian domination with their newly introduced Celica GT4 ST165. Sure, at this point they proved no match for the Integrale, but it did potentially indicate what was to come for the sport in the 1990s. Despite Group B ending what many called the golden era of rallying, things were only going to hot up over the next few years, as a few certain manufacturers showed that maybe it doesn't just have to be the Europeans who are good at rallying, the Japanese might have a knack for it too.